call myself a conservatarian. And by conservatarian, I mean I'm part conservative, part libertarian. I like autonomy. I like to do things my way. I feel like the less government on me, the better off I am. And yet sometimes there are phrases that come across the uh, the modern culture that cause me to pause about even that level of individualism that I find appealing about the American experiment. Today on Life Talks, my name is Dan. I'm with Ben. We're the teaching pastors at Life Fellowship in Cornelius, North Carolina. We're going to continue our series on stupid things people say <laughs> and uh, things that uh, are part of our modern vernacular, uh, cliches and comments and so forth. And and we've done we've done several already, but today we're going to look at my body, my choice. My body, my choice. You hear that a lot. You hear that a lot. Now, yeah. normally- It's on placards, on posters and things like that. Yeah, that and see. almost probably 95, 98% of the time, it's dealing with the topic of abortion. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, there, there I've seen it- So usually it's women holding- I mean, you don't see a guy holding these, <laughs> these no, placards I've, up. I've seen you know, it you know used in I mean? kind of crossover activism a little <clears throat> bit with homosexuality. And, Correct. And, and, you know, there, there are- there are cousins to this where it's like, um, you know, as long as you're consenting adults or, or okay, what so happens in the bedroom is none of the government's decision. Get the government out of my bedroom. Yeah, do, do you remember oh, that yeah, in that the was... 90s? But now we want the government in our bedroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's come full circle because now the government has to, you know, push what happens in our bedroom. We have to approve of what happens in everyone's bedroom. That's yeah. kind of the, the switch yeah. that the government has made on us. So, so. so but we're, today we're going to talk my body, my choice. My body, my talk choice. Talk about it as it relates to um, vaccinations. abortion, vaccine. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's it. How that's could I miss that one? whole reason why we're talking. No, we're, I'm Yeah, teasing. vaccinations is yeah. a, a big one that, that's coming up on that too. So, all right, Ben, do you agree with the statement? Um, I, I think that, well, first of all, I believe that um, this statement has more to do about theology than biology. Let me just say that, uh, say, say that, because I think for, for most of us, um, when it comes to my body, my choice, we, we think of it as um, what, what people are saying is there's this autonomy that I am supposed to have over my own body. And it's because of my own biology that I am making these decisions. But really what we're saying here is, no, this is a, you're, you're making a theological statement because the whole idea is how autonomous are we? Yeah. Who's really, the, who really has the autonomous authority over, over me? So if, if there is no God, then yeah, I, I, I should be able to say and do with my body whatever I want to say and do. And, you know, th there is no one that can tell me what to do with my body. But if there is a God, then that changes the entire landscape or, or conversation. So I think that's what, um, to, to me, that's where the, I always say this is a that that's this is a statement that's about theology and not biology. So what do you say to the person who is not a professing believer? They don't care about spiritual things. They're, they're not interested in it at all. Well. I, yeah, I I think that's the hard part because if someone's theology, if there if there is no authority over their life that is God, then you can't really, you know, ask them to 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 live by your by your standards. I think all you can do is point to if if you are the one who gets to make all the decisions on your about yourself, um, and there's no external if if your physical material body is not sacred. If it was not designed by God, if it was not chosen by God, if you were not knit together in your mother's womb, um, then yeah, you li live according to what your philosophy is. But but how? What are the regrets that you have for doing? I think you just have to play that out. If that if that's how you're going to live, then you got to be consistent with that. Um, but I think that's where you have to have a conversation about authority. You have to have a conversation about God. You have to have a conversation about sacredness. What is sacred? Is it are, is the material world sacred? Because I think even in the New Testament day, there was this idea that the spiritual is spiritual, the material is non-spiritual. And we can fall into that kind of Platonic philosophy today. But what the Bible teaches us is that the material world is spiritual, or the material world is sacred, so to speak. So don't think that just because something is material, it does not mean that it is not sacred. 
um, sex and sexuality is sacred. Uh, it's not just when I go to the temple and offer sacrifices. That's everything in my life. That's the whole point of Jesus. The whole point of the worship of God is that all of life is sacred. My work is sacred. My rest is sacred. My my marriage is sacred. Everything about my life, my physical body, my my mind, my heart, my soul, my flesh, it is it is working in conjunction with with God himself. And so that to me is, it's a, it's a differing of worldviews that you're really dealing with. So yeah, if someone says my body, my choice, um, what they're really saying is what they believe about God, not necessarily what they believe about, you know, who they are. So I think that's, that's a distinction I think we need to make. Now, why do we as Christians, why do we as Christians reject that? That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. And I want to, we'll spend a little bit more time on this, but I do want to move to a political conversation about it as well, because it is, while it is theologically from its foundation and all things are, uh, there are political ramifications yeah. for it, but s- sticking with the, the theological implications on it, uh, one of the, one of the things we, we have to remember, particularly when it comes to the issue of abortion, is that uh, none of us are operating on a vacuum regardless. Yeah. Uh, our decisions impact others. But in the issue of abortion as well, there is another body in, in, in Absolutely. play Absolutely, yes. And and so when and, and our rights end where the other body begins. Correct. I mean, and that is a legal premise. Uh, you, I remember what Supreme Court decision was, but it's basically your rights end where my nose begins. Right. But, but on this issue for the person who says, I should be entitled to end a pregnancy because it is my body and I am at this point the, you know, the the person in charge and, mm-hmm. and and you know the debate then begins is when does a body have rights when yeah, does a body have autonomy who is a person right it is a person at the moment of conception is that is that a is that a a, lot, a person a personhood is that attributed at that moment yeah and i realize we're mi- missing topic mixing topics a bit but you know it, it drives me nuts to hear many activists and progressives right now uh, as it relates to the pandemic are are talking about uh, uh about the government roles and and, yeah. and, and so forth yeah. and uh and they always say follow the science follow the science follow the <laughs> science well the science is pretty clear that life begins at conception absolutely right? yeah. if we, if we found a one cell or organism on on mars every headline tomorrow would be life found on mars that is brilliant and you're exactly (laughs) right i mean we would go bonkers if there was a tiny singular cell uh amoeba uh, anywhere in the universe we would go bonkers over that but the fact that one exists within the womb of another human being within a woman we find that no that's debatable right right so so i mean it's it, it and you know, whatever refutation we come to the person who is the the adamant activist for abortion rights and so forth, they're going to find a reason to dispel it right, and, and to ignore it. But one of the, one of the things we, we ought to, as believers, understand is this. And, and I think... This is this covers more than just the abortion issue or the vaccine issue, and, and that is this. In Christ, we have no rights. We've been bought with a price. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are called bond servants and slaves to Christ. Yeah. And Christ is the you know the word of God and the word of God is truth. Mm-hmm. Christ is truth. Mm-hmm. I am the way, the truth and the life. And so when we understand that our rights end with our relationship with Christ begins. We have been purchased and are owned lock stock and barrel by Christ. Yeah. When we get to that point, it it for at least for me, and I believe it ought to be a part of the Christian spiritual formation, is that we stop asking the questions that are self-centered and ask the questions that are God-centered. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, again, this is a biblical principle. If you, in, in a couple of passages of Scripture that deal with the, the way in which we treat our bodies, there's a lot of verses that deal with how we treat our bodies. But one of them, one of the most profound is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when— uh, Paul is talking about the idea of of fulfilling sexual desires in the body, and when you you shouldn't you shouldn't go uh, have a sexual relations with a prostitute because you're joining your body with her body, and this is that's an act of uh, you're you're violating you're violating God's standard of holiness and, and honor. And this is what he says: um, flee from sexual morality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual mor- but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know, here's what it is, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The whole idea, the Christian belief that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, 
the Holy Spirit comes to indwell inside of us. It's this doctrine of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Um, and when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, our bodies become temples. They become a sacred residing place of God. So therefore, if the Holy Spirit is living inside of me, he is the one who's in charge. Mm-hmm. He is the one that gets to determine what I do with my body and what I don't do with my body. Because my body is now sacred. It's a sacred temple where God exists. And if whatever God wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever God says not to do, that's what I'm not going to do. But that's the idea of th- that we are now owned and bought with a price. We are not our own. That is a fundamental understanding of of Christian doctrine re- relating to our own bodies. And it's also one that brings about, you know, principles of temperance and other issues that I think right. are important because it's easy for us to uh, to be upset with the abortion activist who carries the placard, my body, my choice, uh, because it's a clear cut issue for us that we believe that every life de- 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 um, deserves to be defended, mm-hmm. even the life of the preborn. At the same time, many believers ignore the principle that you just talked about, mm. uh, and we abuse our bodies. We abuse our bodies in a variety of ways, everything from gluttony. You know, it's always been interesting to me that I've, I've watched multiple 450-pound pastors preach against the <laughs> sins of, of abortion <laughs> and, and, and other, other things, yeah. uh, but, but yet very, very obviously guilty of gluttony. Correct. Um, yeah. the, the, you know, even, even what we uh, consume intellectually, whether it's pornography or or um, or just you know mindless sensuality entertainment, yeah. entertainment yeah. and so forth um, and, and and again you somebody always wants to talk about well that's just legalistic I don't think being thoughtful about what we do with the gift of God the gifts of God including our body um, and being temperate in that and being mm. and being careful and being mindful is is a good definition of legalism correct I I think what you're saying is so important. What we have got, we've got to have a a holistic perspective. Obviously, the extreme of my body, my choice is the taking of another life. I mean, that's the, the where that phrase came from. And they're being intellectually dishonest and scientifically dishonest. Be, and, and, and even the idea of what about that bo- the per, that child's body mm-hmm. and their choice? Like that, like they're not even being consistent with their own ethic. Right. right, correct. I mean, so there's all kinds of inconsistencies that the world does, but we, like you said, can be just as inconsistent because number one, we don't really view the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So we will misuse and abuse our bodies in ways that we don't really treat the. You know, it's kind of like uh, you know, I, I've heard people. You know, my wife eats healthy. I eat healthy, and um, one of the things that people that know my wife and joke around with her, you know, they'll say like, oh, you're going to leave a healthy corpse behind, but, you know, th- mm-hmm. like just joking around. But the, the idea is, no, we should, even Paul says, whatever you do, whatever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. We've got to be more consistent with taking care of our bodies. Um, and there's, th- these are the two extremes. One is I don't really care about my body because one day I'm going to go to heaven. Right. And mm-hmm. so just whatever. But the other extreme is I'm going to abuse my body. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And even Paul talks about that. Colossians two twenty three says, um, uh, "These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self made religion, and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh." Hmm. This whole idea that uh, asceticism or severity of the body is almost like I'm going to starve myself out, or I'm going to beat myself, or I'm going to, you know, it's like the monks that used to wear the burlap in the Middle Ages. Um, this idea, you know, self, you know, you know, whipping self flagellation. Yeah. That, that kind of thing. I was about to say flagellation, but I'm not sure if that no, was fl- flagellation is the correct word. Okay. Cause what do you, never mind. <laughs> we'll, we'll pass now my, on. <laughs> now my curiosity is uh, what word did you mean? But <laughs> I don't know. This is, let's just keep this focused on, uh, on the Bible. But anyways, uh, I'm, I'm distracted um, right now. <laughs> So, um, so anyways, I, I think that that's the other extreme. The other extreme is we, we I'm going to beat my body to, to penalize it, to keep it in, in control, right? And so I think we either live out of control or we beat ourselves to, you know, try to get control. And it's just both of those. are. It's about walking in step with the spirit, understanding our bodies are the temple. I don't want to abuse it. I don't want to misuse it. I don't want to. Uh, beat myself to you know it's almost like what paul says in with asceticism and severity 
it's there's this middle road and he says this in first corinthians 9 where it says i discipline my body Mm -hmm. right and i bring it under submission um just like an athlete exercises and, and disciplines themselves that's what we need to do with our own bodies our own appetites our own desires knowing that our bodies sometimes will take over they'll we'll be in a moment and be like you know what I'm just going to have that third piece of chocolate cake because I feel like it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And all of a sudden after we have the third piece of chocolate cake, we're like, I shouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. You know? So these are the things that we, as we walk with God, that's why, again, this all comes back to our theology. What do we believe? Do we believe that God cares about just when I read my Bible, just when I pray? Or does God care about everything? Does he care about what I eat? Does he care about my exercise? Does he care about whether I stay up late or not stay up late? Does he care about what I whether I get drunk and I'm hurting my liver? Like these, all these things. God cares about everything. Yep. He cares about everything. He cares about every single decision you make that affects not just the spiritual heart inside of us or the mind inside of us. He cares about what happens to our physical bodies. And that to me, no, no other proof of this is that the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, not as a spirit, not as a phantom. He rose with a physical body. The idea that the material world, the body is sacred. And he chose, the the second person of the Trinity chose to be, to have flesh and blood for eternity. Hmm. Should tell us something about what God thinks about flesh and blood. Hmm. And I think that is something that's so profound that if we don't understand the fullness of of the gospel and the implications of the lordship of Jesus in our life, we will miss out on on this in this area of our lives. All right, let's shift gears a little bit though and talk about the political implications because this is a political statement as well as yeah, a theological yeah. or, or f- philosophical statement at least. And 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 so does the government the, or should the government have the right to tell you what to do with your body? You, you know. We have helmet laws in many states. Mm -hmm. We have seatbelt laws. Correct. Um, So the answer to that, to some extent, is yes. Correct. Um, At at, at the same time, um, being the conservatarian that I am, I (laughs) resent seatbelt laws. I I feel like as an independent moral agent and and an American citizen, I should have the right to be an idiot if I want to be. Correct. Right? I should have the – I don't want the government telling me that uh, uh, you must only – you know, you must weigh, you know, 190 pounds or, or you know, you, you can't go to the grocery store. Yeah. There, there, are, there are some things. So why why is this something that as a country we have an interest in saying the government needs to tell tell us that abortion is, is illegal? Mm-hmm. I, I think that every, every government is going to draw a line at some place along the spectrum of what you can and cannot do with your body. Right, I mean, that just—it's just a reality. There's no society that's free of just pure license of go ahead and do what you want. Like, at some level, the government says, "No, you cannot put cocaine in your body." Mm-hmm. Right? You're, you no, you cannot. Uh, you know, do you cannot use? There, there's so many different. You cannot prostitute your body for for money. I mean, there's things that a society will come around and say, "No, there's a line here that we're going to." Uh, you know, say these are these are restrictions based on what ethics are a, a, a common culture will have. Um, but but I, so I think every culture just has these dividing lines. The question we've got to ask ourselves is: Are the dividing lines that that a government has come up with is it pure arbitrary or is it built on something that is that is transcendent? Now, obviously, cultures that have a Judeo Christian ethic are going to be more in line with standards that reflect the nature the laws and the good the goodness of god correct so i mean those are the things that we've got to be aware of and the more that a civilization moves away from a judeo-christian worldview the more those kinds of laws become very blurry yeah. very well, very inconsistent one of the things you know if you you study the origin of laws and so forth the best laws are not laws that determine right and wrong the best laws are those that that support what we are obviously understand is right and wrong. Correct. That's why we you, you make a, the fact that we have a law that says you're not supposed to murder or rape does not mean that uh, 
absent the law, murder and rape is okay. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. And, and, and so one of the things, you know, if we value life, mm. if we value morality, if we value, uh, you know, uh, the, these rights of individuals, then to me it is an obvious choice that we would protect the life of, of those who cannot speak for themselves. Absolutely. Be they at the very, very beginning of life yes. or at the very, very conclusion yes. of life, we have a moral responsibility to speak in their defense. Absolutely. Which is, which is a part of, of uh, uh, you know, my motive motivation as, as a pro-lifer. So we're, we're, we're at the end of our, our time allotment for this, but as, as, as we conclude the, you know, the thought of my body, my choice, what would you say to the believer who's, who's trying to engage uh, someone who has th- this philosophy? Mm-hmm. What, what would be the best thing to, to approach them with? I, I think I would try to, I, I don't think I would attack the saying. I, I, would, I, would, I would, don't get in an argument or debate about the saying. What I would try to get, what I would want to do is ask a lot of questions of what are you trying to say with that statement? What are you afraid of? What are you, what are, what are your thoughts on, you know, and, and ask a lot of questions to find out because if the issue is abortion, if the issue is something else, um, ask them why they are so, uh, so dogmatic in that. And, and you might even want to talk about the inconsistencies of that statement, you know, pointing out what about the body and the choice of the life inside of you? Mm. You know, those are the things that, are, again, it's it's better to, to have these conversations face to face, not over the Internet. Um, but but simply to, if someone says my body, my choice, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. That's not going to help them. You're not going to uh, win anybody over. You're not going to win anybody over. You're also not going to win anybody over by reciting 1 Corinthians 6 to, to someone who doesn't believe in the Bible. I mean, mm-hmm. you, we, have, we obviously have the authority of the Word of God and the authority of Jesus and the reality of the Holy Spirit that guide our, our lives. Um, they do not. And so do not expect them to have the same same right. convictions. That, yeah, I think that's one of the things that Christians, sometimes we really mess up. And we, we assume that because someone doesn't ha- is not a follower of Jesus, well, they should have the same convictions as I do. No. that's The point is you have to bring them to Jesus first before right. they can have the convictions of holiness. So... Yeah. So, and, and, and I think that's, that's an important thing to just to remember as, as we close out. Um, we are all moral agents before God who will give account of, yeah. account of, uh, accountability to him for the decisions we make. And f- we need to make sure that we examine our own hearts. Mm. And one of the things that the reason we're doing this series is because we believe that as Christians, we have a responsibility to be careful thinkers, to yeah. not just adopt these cliches because yeah. they're catchy or yeah. memorable or or at first blush, sound convenient or correct, yeah. but rather align them with what we know to be really real, really true, and that is the Word of God. Can I just say one last thing before we end? Um, in no way, I mean, some some of these phrases can be redeemable. The redeemable threat is, obviously, we would never condone abuse or neglect of any kind of someone's right. personal you know, autonomy and, and personhood and body. So I think sometimes, as we are as we are attacking some of these statements and, you know, don't, please don't hear what we're not saying. Right. Truths never contradict yes, themselves. Yes, absolutely. So, right. so, All right. Well, this has been another episode of Life Talks, and I hope you'll continue to tune in and share this with your friends. And also just be discerning wherever you go, whatever you see, whatever you hear, ask yourself, how does this align with the eternal truth of God? This has been Life Talks. Thanks again for listening.